Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shell Point Today for Wednesday, October 26th. I'm Dan Philgreen. Coming up on today's show, the good old professor, Adrian Kerr, talks about Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla. And Ruth Duber will return to the kitchen for another mouth-watering dish. But first, don't forget that tomorrow is the time for Stocktoberfest. The month of October is known for German festivals, or Oktoberfests, as they are often called. And the folks at the Legacy Foundation, in cooperation with Feinmark National Bank and Trust, decided to incorporate that theme into their fall financial event, where you'll learn all about an assessment of the global macro environment in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Current views on equity markets and the associated risks and reasons will be presented. The event will be complete with customary German sweets and refreshments and a German Oompa band. Stocktoberfest begins at 9.15 a.m. in the Social Center with refreshments and the concert happening at Friendship Point on the island at 10.30 a.m. Call to sign up at 466-8484. After the German-style celebrations are over, the next attraction up is the Aviation Club meeting tomorrow at 1.15 p.m. in the all-new clubhouse, the club at Shell Point. Prior to the meeting, a helicopter will land just outside the club. Bo Gillum and David King of the Florida Forest Service will talk about preventing and managing wildfires. They will be showing video footage of actual firefighting in progress in our district. Following the presentation, everyone will go outside for a demonstration with the helicopter of how they make a water drop to fight wildfires. Don't miss the Aviation Club meeting tomorrow. And finally, on Thursday evening, you can dine on Fort Myers Beach at the Fresh Catch Bistro. Court pickups begin on the island at 4.30 p.m. for this outing, where you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the best service, food, and view that the beach has to offer. Entrees run from $14 to $50, and the cost of the outing is $7. And now, let's turn our attention to something else you're sure to get a charge out of. It's Professor Adrian Kerr's Academy class on the War of the Currents. From the late 1880s until the 1890s, there were competing electric power transmission systems in the U.S., the competition of the wars focused on commercial competition, electrical safety, and the media campaign that grew out of it. To tell us more about this in greater detail is Professor Adrian Kerr and Terry Kolath. Hello, I'm Terry Kolath. I'm here today with Professor Adrian Kerr, who has developed yet another new class for us, bringing history to life in the Academy of Lifelong Learning. Today, we're talking about his new class, Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla the war of the currents. Adrian, this is such an interesting war that you're going to tell us about. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be here again at Shell Point. The subject came up recently because living in Fort Myers, you can't help but know the connection with uh, Edison, the Edison homes, etc. So we're sort of Edison files here in mm -hmm. Fort Myers. Um, and uh, recently, the Tesla car company, uh, which Elon Musk has started uh, firsthand himself, um, has become talked about for the last two years. You know, are we moving away from gasoline-powered cars mm -hmm. to, to hybrid cars, and then finally to elect pure electric cars? And time will tell, but there's a huge trend now throughout the world to move towards electric cars. Throughout the world? Throughout the world, um, it's particularly in the United States. Um, but the technology is being developed in China, and uh, every country is looking at uh, what it needs to do um, to meet the customer's requirement to have clean fuel, clean uh -huh. cars. And we'll come back to cars and batteries and green later before we finish. But the starting point is uh, our friend, Mr. Edison, um, and he was so creative and developed so many patents um, that it's not too surprising that he, his mind jumped from the phonograph to um, the ticker tape um, and to um, light. And for some time, um, there have been experiments throughout the world um, on actually generating um, electricity um, to produce light. And they realized that, um, that was, we're close to having electric light in the home, but somebody needed to produce a device that, that you could connect electricity to, which would actually illuminate the home cheaply, reliably, to a high standard of, of, of brightness. Um, and Edison, of course, gets the, the credit. And the course is powered by um, what he considered to be the, the natural form of electricity. And now we're getting a little bit technical, but it was called direct current. It's a battery, effectively. So you can connect your battery today to a light bulb, uh, the car, etc., and that's direct current. DC. DC, uh -huh. right? So people know of it, DC. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with DC is if you transmit DC power, um, because it's low voltage, 
Um, it, it, it takes a lot of energy to transmit. It's very expensive to have transmission lines, and it doesn't travel very far. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a concentration of people, and that's, where, that's why um, the, the big city centers were the sure. first to experiment. Um, so you see New York and you see Chicago um, experimenting with uh, the first of Edison's, using Edison's light bulbs, with a power generation system which he developed, which was copied from the UK, but that's okay. Um, he developed uh, DC generators, which were big monster machines, it powered these light bulbs and it grew and grew on Wall Street, etc. It was the first, first experiment. So now we have DC current providing light through his light bulbs. The problem is, how do you transmit the, this electricity cheaply to outlying areas, farms, villages? Right. Um, and uh, work had been going on in parallel in Europe with alternating current which is, uh, provides, provides the same form of electricity, but by, by an alternating wave. Um, and here, you can boost the voltage from 12 volts, for instance, or 6 volts, up to 220 volts or 110 volts. So your transmission efficiency is much, much better, less copper, less expense. Um, and so the, the movement grew. Let's not use DC current, let's use AC current, because the whole process becomes more efficient. Now, you can imagine the vested interest of our friend Edison um, was dead against this concept. And in oh. fact, ir irony was that Tesla um, from Eastern Europe was hired by Edison to develop the DC concept in Europe. And, Ed and Tesla had been working in his back backyard, so to speak, on developing a reliable um, device that could produce AC current. He came to America and fell out with Edison. Edison didn't pay him what he Tesla thought he was a Jew, and they fell out, and they became bitter enemies for the rest of their lives. And so two different electrical systems then fought each other for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, the argument that Edison um, put uh, against using AC was it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you can kill people with AC current. You can, it's hard to kill somebody with DC current. You can't be done. <laughs> and he gave a terribly gruesome example in that he sponsored, Edison's assistant sponsored the first electric chair. So here is Edison and his company showing to the world that you can actually kill a human being deliberately instead of hanging them, you can kill them through an electric chair. And this was the propaganda that they were spreading, saying AC current kills people. They actually did gruesome experiments where they electrified a horse in front of an audience to show how dangerous um, AC oh current was. So this was, that's why I say it's current wars. War, this was absolutely. which of the two technologies, which, which like uh, the VHS system, you know, the tape that we had, which one's going to win out? One's going to win out, and the fight to the death. And Westinghouse came alongside Tesla, who was an inventor. Westinghouse um, developed a, an alternative system to the one that uh, General Electric, uh, um, now called General Electric, which was Edison's company. And they fought it out and fought it out and fought it out until finally the efficiency of um, alternating current won the day and nobody uses direct current to this time. Fascinating. And then if we jump now to the Tesla name, he, he was a bit of a crank. I mean, he, he was brilliant and yet uh, withdrawn. He lived in a hotel. He never married. Um, he came up with all sorts of crazy ideas that you could transmit um, radio waves to the earth and you could plug in to parts of the earth and pick up radio waves. Concept, brilliant, but the manifestation led to his failure and bankruptcy and he died mm -hmm. penniless. And no, really? um, you'd have thought, never heard of Tesla, apart from historians like myself, until... Elon Musk developed his electric car concept. And this is using batteries uh, to replace the um, internal combustion engine. And it seems like a great idea because it's super green. It doesn't have any emissions. Um, the problem, of course, electric cars is their range. Um, most of us want to go three or 400 miles before we fill up with gas. Um, so the, the drive for all electric car manufacturers in recent years has been to increase their range and they've got more and more and more efficient batteries. Um, and now there are cars being made by General Motors and Ford and hopefully Tesla that can actually deliver 200 mile range, which means that you can travel you know, some distance, you can do a four hour journey for instance, and then recharge quickly, hopefully. And that's the next trick is um, you get to somebody's house in Jacksonville and you've got zero left in your electric car, you need to plug in and that'll take some time. So you'll see over the next few years, more efficient batteries, bigger range, 
and faster charging. And that's probably the way in which cars will go in the next 50 years. So once again, Professor Adrian Kerr will bring us the historical background to what's new and exciting in electricity. And now it's time to take you to Roosterber's Kitchen to see what's cooking at Shell Point. Today, David Lee is making a special olive dip, which is great for parties, special occasions, or whenever you may invite friends over. Here's Ruth Duber along with David Lee. Hi, I'm David Lee and it's What's Cooking at Shell Point and... And I'm Ruth Duber. And David is going to do a wonderful dish today. I was asking him if he couldn't do something for appetizers or something, because we haven't, we haven't had many appetizer recipes, and so he's going to do one with my favorite ingredient, and that's olives. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Yes, it is. So, David, I'm, I'm going to let you take over. I'm going to make a black olive tapenade. Uh, and once again, people tell me it's easy to do, and uh, it lasts in the, in the fridge for a long time, so uh, the main ingredient is olives. And uh, I got you a couple kinds here. Uh, if I don't do anything else, I'll just go to Publix and buy a can of Kalamata olives. Just make sure they're pitted when you buy <laughs> yes. them, because if you get to, it takes forever if you if you don't have them pitted. Now there's a couple secret ingredients to this: anchovy paste, just a small amount. And for, at least for the first few years I made this, I didn't tell my wife there was anchovy paste in it, because she go go. Oh, I don't like anchovies. But I learned in the kitchens that this is kind of one of those secret ingredients. I don't like anchovies either, but you put just a little bit of this in tapenade or some other things, and it just brings out the flavor. So we're going to use a little anchovy paste. We're going to use a small amount of capers. And we got two kinds of capers here today. And then I'm going to use some shallot or onion you can use, and some fresh lemon juice. And since I've got a nice fresh lemon, I'm going to put some zest from the, from the lemon in it today also. And since we had it here in the kitchen, uh, some fresh chopped parsley. My recipe didn't call for that, but the fun part about making it a tapenade is you can kind of vary the recipe. Uh, and speaking of that, for today, I went to my favorite little uh, grocery store, Touch of Italy, and for the special today, rather than just black olives, we've got Sicilian, Kalamata, and black olives. And I kind of like to go in and say, give me some different olives, because it just changes the flavor each time. So that, and then uh, just enough olive oil, I'm going to say in the recipe, a quarter of a cup, plus or minus, but just enough to get the consist consistency, which you'll see when we're done here. So let me start by cutting the shallot. And um, uh, I like to use shallots because I, I, I don't care for garlic. Actually, we can't have it. And shallots, a nice sweet flavor. They're small. And uh, uh, I just love to I cook with everything with shallots. Mm -hmm. So I'll chop up the bottom part here that didn't get cut. And there you have it. So now I think we'll go to the blender. So it's six ounces of olives. And this is one of those recipes where impro improvise. Do whatever you want. OK, and then we're going to put the capers in. And your one shallot. i to get the last few there. And the secret ingredient that we don't tell Margie we use. Just about a teaspoon of it. And um, most, re uh, most grocery stores have the anchovy paste. I find it a lot easier than trying to deal with anchovies because what do you do with the rest of them? This keeps very nicely in the refrigerator kind of forever. <laughs> To put a little pepper in it. I don't salt this because I find... Oh, olives are salty anyway. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. and so we don't want to put um, too much salt in it. 
and we'll put a little parsley in here. And now, if I can, I have this handy dandy little zester that I saw at the kitchen supply space for, it's, it's $12 and it really makes nice, fine zest. So I'm gonna do the zest of half a lemon. Then I put, it says one tablespoon, but I just put the, the, the juice of about a half a lemon in there. Kind of try to catch the seeds and it'll tip. So there you have all the ingredients except for the olive oil. So if we could, let's go over to the blender since it's plugged okay. in on the wall here. Mm -hmm. Now I've made this an, enough times to where I sort of know what a, a quarter of a cup is or I sort of know what. So I always start by just pouring a little bit in and remember, you can always add, but you can't take it back out. Put the lid on. You just need to push it down a little bit when you're making the blender. It'll make it just fine in a blender. So once again, start off with three or four tablespoons of olive oil and we'll add more if we need it. Oh, if you want to look in here, uh, it's just the consistency I like. Kind of it's like a little rough paste. So, I think there was a little bit more juice from these olives that, that helped bring it together. So, now, we'll pour it into my dish here. Okay. And what I brought with me, we really enjoy serving this with cheese and crackers and appetizers when people come over. And it just mm -hmm. adds a different flavor to it. Yeah, okay. You want to get back over there? Should yeah. we do it right here? Want to do it right here? How about right here? Okay. And as, as it become our, our theme here, we'll put a little bit of... The thing I really like about this is, this is for my... Are gluten-free friends. Okay. This, there you go. <laughs> this is. Those are not gluten-free, but I've got some gluten-free crackers here too. So. Oh, with sea you salt. Can, you oh, can okay. with sea salt, so you can accommodate all your friends. Uh -huh. So Ruth, okay. give it a try here. See what you think. Okay. Put some on this. Mm. Mm. I give you the knife. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's delicious. It really is. And you were right. You can't taste anchovies, which is, <laughs> I don't care for I, them. You told me before the show you didn't like anchovies. Mm -hmm. I, mm. uh, mm. The other thing um, I learned, too, this also makes a nice glaze to put on salmon. I know neither one of us likes salmon. <laughs> See, I don't like I, salmon either. <laughs> but uh, try this, put a little on your salmon before you bake it, oh, and it'll just, okay. add, it'll just mm -hmm. add a when you serve that, you go, wow, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, mm -hmm. there you have it, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Black Thank olive you. tapenade. Thank you so much, David. I have my mouth full, but <laughs> I will put the recipe up on the website, and I hope you'll try it. So Me too. For now. We'll be back Bye again. now. And now it's time to cover all of today's happenings, Academy News, menus, and Village Church Connections. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's happening segment of Shell Point TV. I'm Dora Robbins, and I'm going to tell you about all the activities we have planned here at Shell Point. We're going to start at 745 with Men's Bible Study, that's at the Osprey Room, Men's Round Robin Tennis, that's at 8 o'clock at the Tennis Courts, also at 8 o'clock we have Pickleball, and that's at the Game Courts on the Island. At 845 we have Lily and Company Jewelers, that's at the Resident Activity Center. And at 9 o'clock we have Jurassic Travel, that's at the Ugret Room. We also have at 9 o'clock watercolor group with Phil Hilton that's at the art studio. And at 9.15 we have card making and scrapbooking that's in the tarpon room on the island. 
We also have at 930 assisted living tea and tour that's at the community room at King's Crown. And at 10 o'clock, we have ladies Bible study that's in the offspring room. We have men's match tennis that's at 10 o'clock at the tennis courts. At 1015, we have model yacht sailing club and that's at the Commons Lake at the Woodlands. We have Fine Mark Investment Roundtable at 1030, and that's in the Oak Room. At 1130, we have a Health Connection. It's Agility, Balance, and Flexibility, and that's in the Health Club, and that's currently closed. At 12 o'clock, we have a Mahjong Party that's at the Cove at the Estuary, and that's full. At 1245, we have Health Connection, Strength, and Conditioning, and that's the Health Club. Sign up is required. We have chess at 1 o'clock, and that's at the Library Lounge. We have coffee with the Village Church Pastor staff, and that's at 115 at the Hospitality Room. At 115, we have Hearing Enrichment Group, that's at Social Center on the Island. And from 1.30 to 3.30, the Model Train Room is open. At 145, we have Health Connection, that's Balance, Stability, and Strength, and that's at the Health Club on the Island. At 2.30, we have Jazz and Stuff, and that's at the Grand Cypress Room at the Woodlands. And at 3, we have Health Connection Pilates Bar Fusion, and that's at the Health Club. At 4.30, we have Indoor Bocce, and that's at the Health Club. And at 5 o'clock, we have Singles Table at the Crystal Dining Room. We have Church Choir in the Choir Room, and that's at 5.45. And our last activity for today is at 7 o'clock, prayer and praise, and that's at the Village Church. Thank you, and we'll see you back here again tomorrow. Hi, I'm Terry Coleth with your Academy Information for Wednesday. At 9 o'clock, our class on Christmas tags continues in the Sable Room of the Woodlands, and at 1 o'clock, our Intermediate Bridge class continues in the Game Room at the Woodlands. Tomorrow, we have a new class, iPhone Eye Photography, with the updated Photos app. Bruce Findlay of Sundial is our instructor. Menus for Wednesday. In the Crystal Room, the Crystal Platter is bratwurst with cabbage and red potatoes. For dinner, they are featuring their Oktoberfest buffet, and the soup of the day is tortilla. In the Island Cafe, the sandwich special is roasted turkey and provolone on focaccia with sweet potato fries for $7.95. Dinner specials in the Palm Grill are stuffed flounder for $17.95 or sirloin steak a poivre for $16.95. All menus are available 24 hours a day at www.shellpoint.net. Hi, I'm Scott Aiding, the employee chaplain, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Village Church, and welcome to Village Church Connections. I've been teaching a, a Bible study with a group of men who are in, managers at Shell Point, and we've been studying the book of Acts, and Acts gives a history of the early church, right after Jesus died and then when he was resurrected, that's about where Acts begins. And while we're doing that, I started to say, you know, I'm really curious. All the other letters in the New Testament, when were they written? Where was Paul again when he wrote a letter to Galatia? Where was he when he wrote some to Ephesus? When did Peter write his letters? Where was he? And I started to do a little bit of research and put some of that information together. And what comes out of it is what you realize is that while Acts is giving the history of the church, there's a whole lot more happening than possibly could have been written. Now, I've had people say to me, I think people made things up about Jesus, and the church kind of exaggerated it. But when you, when you study and do a little bit of research and look into how many people were involved, how many different places they went to and where they lived, and all the interconnectedness of relationships, the letter writing and people going back and forth, you realize, you know, if there is some kind of conspiracy, this was a huge, huge conspiracy. There's just no way anybody could pull something like that off. And the benefits of the conspiracy, humanistically speaking, a lot of them were, you know, picked on, persecuted, even put to death for what they did. So it's an amazing exercise in faith 
to look at some of the history of the beginnings of the church. And that's what Acts does for us. So I just want to inspire you a little bit, encourage you, become a bit curious. How did the church begin? Just what was going on? Where were the cities? Uh, who was where? What was happening? And as you do, and you read through the book of Acts, you say, you know, this is clearly God moving people to do things they wouldn't have otherwise done. It's an amazing story. So I hope you're inspired to study again the book of Acts. This is Scott Aiding once again on behalf of the Village Church. We're so glad you joined us for Connections, and may you have a blessed day. Thank you for joining us for today's program. On tomorrow's show, Terry Kolath will feature an academy instructor for us to learn more about Beyond the Classroom. And she'll also visit with Bruce Finley to hear the latest about the iPhone, Apple TV, iPad technologies, and upcoming classes. Until then, this has been Shell Point Today for Wednesday, October 26th. I'm Dan Philgreen, and on behalf of everyone at SPTV, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. <laughs>